Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for the Lord will speak peace to the people of God and to the faithful ones, to those who turn to the Lord in their hearts. Surely salvation is at hand. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Let us worship God. Sheltering Lord, Almighty King of creation, our souls praise you this day, and once more every Amen resounds from your people, for indeed we gladly adore you. Transform our adoration into humble reflection that leads us to acts of justice, mercy, and love toward all your children. Amen.
Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, trusting in God's grace, let us pray together. We confess, Lord, with thanksgiving, that you have made us in your image so that we can remember you, think on you, and love you. But that image is so worn and blotted out by faults that it cannot do that for which it was made unless you renew and refashion it. O Lord our God, grant us grace to desire you with our whole heart that so desiring we may seek and find you, and so finding you, we may love you, and loving you, we may hate those sins from which you have redeemed us for the sake of Jesus Christ. May the God of mercy forgive you all your sin, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Friends, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in that same name, welcome to this time of worship. We give thanks that the stirrings of the Spirit have led you to this place today, whether you join us in the sanctuary or online. Surely the body of Christ is more complete on account of the offering of self that you make in this service today. Thanks be to God. Please would you sign the friendship pads located either on the ends of your pews or via the link online. We are so eager to greet you by name and to welcome you more fully into the prayer life of this congregation. As the lazy days of summer start to cede space to the reliable rhythms of fall, we look forward to resuming much loved parts of the program year in this congregation come September. So do see your bulletin for more information about Bible study, Wednesday evening dinners and Vespers services and a welcome back potluck. And then join us in marking both calendars and anticipating gladly the chance to gather still more regularly as the community that God is sto steadily knitting together as one in Christ. But no need to wait until September for that because coffee, cookies, and companionship await us after worship just through these doors to your right at the front of the sanctuary. Would you come to make yourself available to this community as friend and fellow surgeoner? It will be so good to have you there. But now let us bend our ears to the eternal word. Let us pray. God, whose voice brought life forth from the formless void. Jesus, whose voice stilled the seizing seas. Speak to us again. 
by your Holy Spirit, rearrange the landscape of our lives and still the churning of our thoughts, that the way would be clear for your word and our hearts might receive it gladly. Amen. Our first reading this morning from Genesis chapter 37. Hear now the word of our Lord. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, in the land of Canaan. And this is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers, and he was a helper to the sons of Billa and Zilpah, his father's wife. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other children because he was the son of old age, and he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And Joseph said, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. And so he sent him from the valley of Hebron. Joseph came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers. He said, Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And so Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. When Reuben heard it, he delivered Joseph out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue them out of their hand and restore him to their father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, there was no water in it. And then they sat down to eat, and looking up they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And the Midianites took Joseph to Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This morning, I invite your prayers for the Reverend Dr. Rachel A. Bear. She is fine, but a little weary. Uh, She was eager to begin her work among us during this past summer so that she would have the necessary time to prepare for beginning campus ministry as each of our surrounding universities kicks off the upcoming academic year. And so Rachel moved here even before her apartment would become available this week. Thanks to the generosity of Mark and Ellen Alston, Rachel and her two cats have enjoyed staying with the Alstons and their cats, but the moving truck that was supposed to arrive on Thursday has finally arrived this morning. If you have recently had the pleasure of moving, you know that there is nothing like the timing of a moving truck arrival to disillusion us to any notion that we are in control of this life. (laughs) The good news is that we anticipated this might happen and granted Rachel the morning off in hopes she would be getting rest after an arduous move. Instead, Rachel worships God with us this morning by upending her own life so that she can be one of our faithful pastors. Rachel, if you're listening as you hoist boxes and tenderly move scared pets into your new home, know that our prayers are with you. Let us pray. The heavens are telling your glory, O God, and the firmament declares your handiwork. Declare to us also through the reading and hearing of your holy word, the truth of the gospel, your good news for all creation. Amen. Our New Testament lesson comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning with verse 22. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. Listen for the word of God. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the lake. But when the disciples saw him walking toward them on the lake, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, in the midst of the early days of the pandemic, I ran across a broad question posed to a large online community, and that question was so provocative as to have struck me with now for more than three years. The question I encountered was, what's considered classy if you're rich, but trashy if you're poor? And that question throws around some problematic and probably offensive labels, but that's also part of its point, right? That the hypocrisy between how society views those with money and means, as opposed to how that same society sees those without money and means, is evidence of a sharp divide based on nothing more than prejudice. 
As you might imagine, the responses the question provoked were sometimes clever, sometimes heartbreaking, often both at the same time. It's relatively easy to type that question into a Google search field for yourselves, but here are a few of the biting, witty, convicting answers offered by the online community. First, owning many dogs or cats at once or owning an exotic animal as a pet is considered classy if you're rich, but trashy if you're poor, as is being dressed in a bathrobe throughout the day. Also making the list are having a penchant for wine, having other people drive you around, making your own alcohol, and keeping a lot of material things around your living space. One respondent nuanced this particular answer by saying that if you're rich, it's called collecting, but if you're poor, it's called hoarding. As I said, there are obvious echoes of the ugliest parts of classism at play here, and that is precisely the point commenters were making through their humor that the same activity is viewed not only through a vastly different filter, but rather through an entirely different lens based solely on whether a person is perceived as wealthy or destitute. Initially, when I first came across this question, I didn't pay much attention to the question itself or to its responses. And even now, as I think of it again, this question is random, and its witty jabs aim right toward our biases. And even so, it was one of those things to scroll past on the way to reading about things that matter, such as this week's news of the wildfires in Maui, or the positioning of nuclear weapons in North Korea and Belarus, even as we mark with soberness the 78th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. These are the news stories that defy our ability to walk above the turmoil, keeping the waves safely beneath our feet. They make us feel as if we are sinking in a, in a sea so tumultuous that we cannot even catch our breath, except perhaps to cry out to Jesus as Peter did, Lord, save me. But sometimes, even amidst the helplessness we feel in the wake of the world's grief, a question that is seemingly banal set among these other more serious events can lodge itself right in the recesses of our minds. Theologian Karl Barth is often cited as saying that a pastor should read with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. The Center for BART Studies at Princeton Theological Seminary has thus far not been able to discover an authoritative source for this quotation, but they have cited several similar remarks in BART's writings and interviews, the closest of which comes from a Time magazine piece on BART published in 1963, in which BART recalls that 40 years ago he advised young theologians to take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both but interpret newspapers from your Bible. Three years later, Bart emphasized the need for Christians to be about God's work in the world, saying the pastor and the faithful should not deceive themselves into thinking that they are a religious society, which has to do with certain themes. They live in the world. We still need, according to my old formulation, the Bible and the newspaper. Regardless of what Bart may or may not have actually said, the practice of reading the Bible and the newspaper and allowing the former to serve as a lens for interpreting the latter is a practice most thoughtful pastors I know try to maintain. So as I read and thought more about the serious headlines having to do with the scourge of nuclear war and wildfires that threaten the land and the planet, and the continued reckoning with systemic racism and classism and their serious consequences for so many people. You see, I read those headlines alongside the story of the sons of Jacob that we find in this week's 
Old Testament text. And as the stories of the patriarchs of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph swirled around me like an ocean wave ever rising, I kept thinking, what's considered classy if you're rich and trashy if you're poor? In so many cases, in fact, in almost every case, people today are treated differently and receive different levels of support, empathy, and critical health care, even disaster relief, based on whether they are perceived as rich or poor, and sometimes as deserving or undeserving, respectively. As a society, we play favorites. That's an ugly truth for sure, but it is one that is as old as time, or at least as old as today's Hebrew scripture story from Genesis. So, let's follow Karl Barth's lead, shall we? Let's try to interpret the news in light of what we find in the Bible. Let's see what shines through when we set that classy if you're rich, trashy if you're poor question slap down right in the middle of our digging around in today's family story from Genesis 37. We can certainly see where the wealth is to be found. Granted, wealth was measured differently in the ancient Near East than it is today, not so much stock portfolios and trust funds, but rather in the possessions of humans and livestock. And it's safe to say that Jacob has done well for himself. Through a combination of hard work and hard scheming, he's ended up with a birthright, an irreplaceable blessing from his father, four wives, numerous offspring, and lots of livestock stock that he sneakily bred for himself from his father-in-law's flock. Last week, we read the part of the narrative in which Jacob sends all his possessions, his wives and his children and livestock across the Jabbok River ahead of him. And as you might remember, Jacob stays behind to wrestle with God, to wrestle with his own demons, to wrestle with who he has been and who he is destined to become before reuniting with his brother Esau. This week, though, the story picks up after Jacob and Esau have buried their father together and then parted ways once more, with Jacob settling with his family in Canaan. There, his flocks and offspring continue to thrive, and all of this material wealth is interpreted at that time as a sign of God's continued favor and blessing. But at the part of the story we pick up today, we start to see a crack in the glass. All is not well. Like his mother, Rebecca, before him, Jacob is playing favorites, playing favorites among his sons loving his younger son Joseph more than all the others, presumably because Jacob loves Joseph's mother, the younger sister Rachel, more than he loves his other wives. Since we want to interpret the world through the lens of the Bible and not the other way around, what if we slightly tweak our overarching question just a little? Here's a new version. What's considered classy if you're the wealthy, favored protagonist of a biblical story, but trashy if you're an actor in a supporting role. More to the point at hand, what's considered commendable or exemplary behavior for Joseph and his father Jacob, but reprehensible and cruel for Joseph's older brothers? Well, for starters, scheming and taunting. Jacob and Joseph are meticulous about it. You've heard enough about Jacob's story from last week, but his younger son's track record resembles his own. When Jacob gives Joseph a robe with long sleeves, oh, time out here. I know, I know, it's not the coat of many colors Dolly Parton sang about or the one we all learned about as kids in Sunday school. The text actually says that Jacob gives Joseph a robe with long sleeves, which means exactly what you think it might mean. Sleeves get in the way of hard work. And that's why we say things like, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. 
The gift of a robe with long sleeves is the gift of a privileged lifestyle. It's the gift of being spared hard labor. Jacob gave to Joseph a robe with long sleeves. All right, so back to the story. So when Jacob plays favorites and gives Joseph this gift of privilege, Joseph doesn't leverage his privilege to help his brothers. Instead, he functions as a spy for his father, checking up on his brother's decisions about where to graze the flock, and he taunts their privilege, his privilege in their faces, telling his older brothers of the dreams in which Joseph envisions that they will someday bow down to him. Now that doesn't sound very much like the poor, innocent Sunday school version of Joseph sold into slavery in Egypt, does it? The brothers have their own issues, to be sure. Jealousy, attempted murder, extortion. They're no saints themselves. I might have a little more empathy for them if they weren't murderous about it, but at the core I can understand that they just wanted a chance in life, a piece of the inheritance due to them. An inheritance they know they'll never see as long as Joseph is in the picture. At least Reuben and Judah show some sign of having a conscience as they each in their own way save Joseph's life, even as they sell Joseph for some quick cash. But on the whole, none of the sons of Jacob falls far from the scheming tree. And neither do we which one glance at the newspaper will tell you. One of the reasons I came to Shadyside Presbyterian Church to serve as your senior pastor is that I was and am astonished by your deep commitment to the thriving of all people. Your hearts are broken open by poverty and illness, hunger and desperation in our own city and in the world God so loves. I believe that you care every bit as much about a cyclone in Malawi as you do about the wildfires in Maui, and every bit as much about refugees who risk drowning as they cross turbulent seas in nothing more than rubber rafts, as you do about billionaires who board a faulty vessel to glimpse the wreckage of the Titanic. And I believe that your commitment to all people is a conviction of your faith, your faith centered in Jesus Christ, your faith that tells you that every person is a child of God, made in God's image, and imbued with the dignity and sanctity of the gift of life. I believe that about you. I have come to know that about you. But I also think that our society as a whole is still very much playing favorites, still flaunting privilege, still grasping the lie of scarcity that tells us that in order to secure our own lives and well-being, we have to make sure to gatekeep regarding who gets the necessary resources to live, whose actions can be labeled classy, and whose same exact actions are relegated trashy. You likely know how the rest of the story goes. Joseph gets drawn up out of the pit and sent into Egypt. Drawn up. Just as Moses will be so named because he gets drawn up out of the river. This detail is a clever hint that Joseph's story is going to lead right on through his enslavement and imprisonment, through Joseph's dream interpretation that lands him in Pharaoh's favor, through Joseph's coaching Egypt through a famine and his forgiving his brothers who come to Egypt to beg for food, through all of the tribes of Israel migrating to Egypt at Joseph's invitation to Egypt where their offspring will eventually be enslaved by a pharaoh who does not remember Joseph. Which is exactly why they'll need Moses, the one who was hidden and drawn up out of the water by a saving hand, the one whose very name means drawn up, 
the one who will lead God's people home again to Jacob and Joseph's home in Canaan. Friends, what we read in the newspaper proves that playing favorites is getting us into trouble. Sometimes it seems downright impossible for us to get out of the mess we're in, enslaved as we are by sin and death, by racism and classism and sexism, by cutthroat competition and jealousy and greed. But the good news, friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. We serve a God who does impossible things, who walks on water, who makes a way where there is no way, who takes what wasn't intended for evil and uses it for good. So will you wonder and imagine with me for a minute? Let's wonder how God is going to draw us up next. And let's find comfort in the fact that as long as we are walking toward Jesus, even when the wind and the rain and the waves surround us and fill us with fear, we can always call to him, Lord, save us. And the one who walks calmly upon the turbulent seas will draw us up with a mighty hand. He'll lead us home, and he will never let us go. In the name of the one who never plays favorites, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of all stories there have been, of all the stories there are, and of all the stories that ever will be, in the name of the one whose love will grab our sinking, flailing arms and never let us go. Amen. let us join our voices with the church throughout the ages, affirming the faith by which we are claimed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. By that same faith, may our hearts be joined in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks, for you hold in your hand the depths of the sea and the heights of heaven. And yet you have reached out to us time and again through whatever storms may rage around us or within our hearts with a strong hand and a tender word of peace. So now we cry out to you, humbly shaping our prayers into words, trusting that you will hear us. Take by the hand and draw up those who know not your loving embrace, O God, those whom the world denies or disregards, those who are searching for acceptance or questioning their own identity, those who show no love because they receive no love. Though tossed and tormented by this world, do not leave these your children to sink, for you speak peace to frightened hearts. Take by the hand and draw up those who are afflicted, O God, those who are faint or crushed by the injustices and prejudices of this world, those who are bent low under the heavy hand of oppression, victims of violence and inhumanity of war and wildfire. Though tossed and tormented by this world, do not leave these your children to sink. For you extend justice and mercy for the thriving of all people. Take by the hand and draw up those who are feeling lost, O God. Those downtrodden by pain or by grief, those who have lost lives, loved ones, or livelihood, home, or health, those who sit in darkness of confusion or addiction, of anxiety or despair. Though tossed and tormented by this world, do not leave these your children to sink. For you catch in the favor of your love all of creation. Gracious Lord, these and all our prayers we offer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who walks on water and draws us up and never will let us go, and who still teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Gracious God, may this act of offering be one more means by which you remake us. Weave us back into the fabric of your economy made of abundance and generosity and justice and joy. And draw up these gifts for your purposes. Pave them with a path of plentitude in order that the vulnerable might find shelter and the weary find rest and the brokenhearted be bound up and the captive set free. We ask it in the good name of Jesus. Amen. Drawn up into a love that will never let you go, go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. And as you go, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and upon those whom you love and upon those whom only God loves, this day and even forevermore. Amen.